Good evening, guys. Today we are going to be taking a look at Unit 1, Section 4, 1-4, uh, which deals with something called homeostasis. The human body is pretty amazing in the fact that your 11 body systems, all the chemical reactions that are in them, all go on and maintain this nice, even balance. You, when you have too much water in your body, you pee more. When you don't have enough, you get thirsty. If the pH of your blood goes up, your body can do something to bring it back down. If you're too hot or too cold, it'll bring the temperature back to where it should be. So it's really neat and amazing that no matter what your body is going through, all the changes that you apply to it every day, it can always maintain this nice, stable environment. We call that ability to maintain homeostasis. So here's our chapter or section heading right here, homeostasis. Homeostasis um, basically means um, to maintain, to be stable, to hang out where you're at. So here's the nice definition of it right here. The ability to maintain relatively stable internal conditions even though the outside world changes continuously. You're constantly bombarding your body with food and water and chemicals that your body has to adjust for. Um, the fact that, that you're the age you are and your body is growing and developing and going through changes, you're also having to make sure that none of that goes out of whack and you grow too fast or too not fast enough. I'm sure some of you have had a summer where you leave, spend 10 weeks at home, come back three inches taller. That's because your body knows when to let it start growing, but also knows, okay, that's too much time to slow it down. So your body is really, really good at trying to maintain these nice, stable internal conditions. Now, who's in charge of watching all that? Well, you've got two things. You've got your nervous system and you have your endocrine system. These two guys work like this together to make sure that you don't go too out of whack, go crazy, you know, grow too much, don't grow enough, and so on. If these were out of whack, then you can get um, different disorders like uh, dwarfism or gigantism, growing too tall or too short, are problems with either the nervous or the endocrine system not communicating effectively. So we're going to learn about how does your body communicate effectively and maintain this nice internal conditions. So taking a look down here, it says homeostatic control mechanisms have three parts. Okay, so we need to know what these three parts are. The first part is called the receptor. And a receptor, just like the word sounds, when you recept or are receptive to something, it means you're willing to um, take it in. So a receptor is something that takes in information from the environment. So this is some sort of sensor that monitors the environment and responds to changes. So you have the ability to feel your environment. You can smell the food or whatever chemicals are out there. You can feel touch, pain, pressure, heat. Um, you can see. So there's all sorts of receptors. Basically, if you go through your five senses, those are your receptors. So hearing, sight, smell, touch, and taste. Those are your five receptors. Now touch does come in a couple of different varieties because you can feel sharp point, you can feel uh, like dull pain, you can feel heat. So there's lots of different types of touch receptors, but the idea of taking information from your outside and bringing it up into your brain for your brain to deal with, those are receptors. Okay, so you have a sensor, and it could be in your skin, in your eyes, in your ears, wherever, and it monitors the environment and responds to the changes. Okay, so that's the main thing. Receptor is your sensor. Okay, so now we've taken in all this information. Where does it go? It goes to the control center. The control center is basically your brain. Okay, it analyzes the information. So when you put your hand on something really hot, your brain says, hmm, that's hot. Is it hot enough to cause any damage? Yes, take your hand off. Not, enjoy. And so, so if you accidentally put your hand in super hot water, then your brain is going to analyze that, say that could damage me, I should probably pull my hand out, and then is going to determine what the response is going to be. Is the response going to be keep your hand in it or pull your hand out? 
So the brain is the main guy who does all the analyzing and it has to, it computes faster than any computer ever can. And within a fraction of a second, you've already figured out all possible outcomes and determined what to do with it. Okay, and the last thing that is part of the homeostatic control mechanism is the effector. When you, well, when you affect change, you are responding, okay? So it's kind of a better word. They call it the effector. The respondor would be probably the better word. So the effector is the thing that responds to the control center. And this could be lots of different things. It can be a muscle that pulls your hand out. Sorry, cat, I have a cat right there. Hi, cat. Um, it could be um, how you, how your body, ugh, I can't think of the right word. How you, how you respond. Do you move away? Do you stay? It's just how, how do you respond? That's the effector. Usually it's a muscle because muscles involve the, the movement of your body and the response. So you pick up some information through your senses, the receptors, they go to your brain, the control center, and then from there they go back down to the effector that tells your body what to do. So over here is a picture that kind of gives an example of how homeostasis works. So your your body temperature has a set point in which it likes. And for most average people, it's 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, I think, what was it, 30, 37, if you're British, 37 degrees Celsius. So we have 98.6 degrees. And so what happens is at your body will pick up from nerve surroundings information, like is it really hot outside or is it really cold outside? That information gets sent to the brain where your brain analyzes, hey, you know what, it's kind of cold and I need to keep my body at this temperature. So what can I do? Because it's cold outside and I'm getting colder, what can I do? Oh, here, let me send some information to my muscles to cause them to shiver. And when I shiver, what does that do? It raises my body temperature back up to the correct temperature. So this is very similar to how a thermostat works in your house. You tell it what temperature you want it to be, okay? 70 degrees. And it gets, the day goes on and gets warmer and hotter. So what happens is that the air kicks on, right? And then it cools it off until it gets back down to 70. It doesn't keep on cooling it over and over again, but once it hits 70, it stops. Well, now it's nighttime. So now the, out, the temperature of the room is going down and down and down, but I still want it at 70. So what happens is the heat kicks on and brings the temperature back up to 70. It doesn't keep on going and make it warm too warm, but it stops at 70 and waits right there. So your body is like these little thermostats and the fact that here's the set point and your body will do what it needs to either turn on the air and cool you off or turn on the heat and make you shiver to make you be at that precise temperature. Now body temperature is the easiest one to talk about with homeostasis, but this works for all sorts of things. The pH levels in your blood, the amount of calcium floating around in your blood at any given time, um, the water content of your blood. So there's all sorts of receptors and effectors. The temperature is just the easiest one to talk about. Okay, so here is, I, I kind of mentioned it already, but here's a better example. All right, I am a teenager that goes to El Dorado High School. My phone, and I'm doing this example because I know you guys know what I'm talking about. My phone says the weather's gonna be up in the 80s. So I wear little booty shorts and a thing tank top. I don't look outside and notice the dark rain clouds and I don't bring a jacket. I'm cold. So who is my receptor in this particular case? Well, we have these special little things in our skin called thermoreceptors. What does therm stand for? Thermos, thermostat, thermometer. It means heat. So we have heat receptors in our skin and they're going, hmm, I'm cold. So send some information to my brain says, I'm cold, as the body's temperature begins to drop. So now I'm, I'm at like 97.8. Okay, so now my brain, the control center says, all right, well, what are you gonna do about that? So my brain has established a set point of 98.6 degrees as an acceptable body temperature, but now it's gotten really cold. It's down to 97.4 because once again, I didn't look outside and I'm wearing shorts and a tank top. So now what's gonna happen? My brain analyzes the information and says, is that an okay temperature? No. All right, what am I gonna do about it? Well, that's where the effector comes in. 
the effector, the brain, tells the parts of your body that can respond to this, your muscles, to begin to shiver and to generate heat. And then that, and also for the skin to create goosebumps, because what does that do? It traps air against your body and insulates it. It's kind of like putting a nice little jacket on like that. See, that's how you should have dressed uh, going out that morning. So you've got this nice, warm, fuzzy layer on you that's keeping you warm. Your muscles are shivering, generating heat. What happens? Your body goes up to 98.6 and your brain says, all right, I'm done. And you stop shivering. Or another thing, the effector is just to tell your brain, to tell your body to go get a jacket, to go put the jacket on to keep you warm. So it doesn't have to be something that you're not in control of. I mean, you can't help but not shiver when you're cold. And so that's one that you're not in control of. But it can also tell your brain, duh, go get a jacket, put it on, you'll be warm. And so those are things that you have control over too. So here's an example of a receptor, a control center, and an effector. So tomorrow I'm going to have you guys come up with some other examples besides that. So you might want to look up, see if you can Google other examples of homeostasis besides heat and temperature. Um, see if you can find calcium levels or water levels or something like that. All right, here's just kind of another picture, um, a nice little graphic representing the balance that your body is in. See this little board right here? Okay, that's your body when it's happy. It's nice and even. So what happens is when it's out of balance, we try to make it go back. And if it goes out of balance this way, we want it to go back that way. So this just shows if there's an imbalance, my stimulus says that my body temperature is too hot. So the receptors in my skin notice that the temperature is warm. So what's going to happen? They're going to send the message to my control center in my brain and it says, hey, it's hot. And so what's going to happen is it's going to tell the effector, my sweat glands, start sweating to cool me off to get me back to normal. Or vice versa, that I can go the other way. I notice that the temperature is too low, so the receptors pick up the information that it's cold. They send it to my brain. My brain says, what am I going to do about that? Well, it's either going to tell my muscles to shiver or tell me to go get a jacket on until I'm back into balance again. So our body likes to be here. It does not like to be there. Okay, so that's just another example of homeostasis. Now, homeostasis in our body is controlled by uh, something called negative feedback or feedback loops. And we'll explain the negative part here in just a second. So here's kind of like a new heading. So negative feedback is when whatever we're picking up, our body responds oppositely. So if I'm too hot, what's the opposite of hot? Cold. How do I make myself cold? I sweat. Other way around. If I'm too cold, what's the opposite of cold? I'm hot. How can I make my body hot? By shivering. Okay? So that's what negative means. It means that these mechanisms cause the variable, whether it's temperature or whatever, to change in a direction opposite of the initial. So if I'm cold, do something to make me hotter. If I'm hot, do something to make me colder. So see opposite, okay? So what's the opposite of positive? Negative. And so that's where negative feedback comes from. So like I just said here, for example, I'm cold, it responds by making me hot. Hot is opposite. I drink too much water, my body responds by increasing the rate of water remo removed, so I pee more. So the more water goes in my body, the opposite of holding on to water is getting rid of the water. So I found this neat little graphic that also represents it. So here's where our body wants to be, this little line in the middle, equilibrium, okay? And so here I am, I'm too hot. Here's what my body does, makes me too cold. And it just kind of goes back and forth and back and forth and getting it just right until we finally equal the, ugh, that's supposed to be a straight line, until we finally hit that set point, okay? So our body will just do the opposite of what it's picking up in order to get it back to normal. So if I'm too cold, it'll make me hotter until we meet back in the middle. Okay, now that's negative feedback. 99% of the cases are gonna be negative feedback. We do have something called positive feedback, where instead of you know, going in the opposite direction to get it like this, it actually starts out like this and gets bigger, 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 bigger like that. 
So this is, we get a result or a response that enhances the original stimulus. Other than opposing it, we wanted to go back to um, the original stimulus. We wanted to get greater instead of flattening it out. So that the activity is accelerated. There's only two cases. So as long as you remember these two cases, you can remember everything else is negative. But here is the example of positive feedback. I'm having contractions and it hurts. Now normally when your body's in pain, like you broke an ankle or something, your body can actually kick out endorphins to make you not feel it. So it goes the opposite, right? Negative feedback. No, 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 not having babies. So you're having contractions, it hurts. What do your hormones do? They cause the contractions to become more intense and more frequent until child, the actual act of the baby coming out of you, shuts it off. So that way, the baby doesn't just, you know, get stuck, because that could kill the baby. So for example, you know, oh, I have a contraction. Oh, oh, look, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. Ah, and then it goes like that, right? Just talk to your parents, your mom, she knows. So that's positive feedback. Instead of doing an opposite response, ouch, I hurt, make me feel better, it's ouch, I hurt, make me hurt more. <laughs> Ain't that nice? Uh, the only other example, so like I said, there's only two. Um, childbirth is one. Blood clotting is the other. So blood clotting is the only other example of positive feedback because what it does is it increases the amount of chemicals that come in and clot the blood instead of, you know, because if you get a clot, Anywhere else, in your lungs, your heart, your body wants to try to get rid of it and by getting, taking away the platelets. Here, when you get a clot, your body says, that's good, here, let me give you some more. And so therefore, it keeps on going until the blood stops flowing, and then that tells it to shut off. So these have shut off switches, but childbirth or the actual uh, clot of blood itself are the off switches, and then that makes positive feedback. So just remember, these are the only two positive, Everything else is negative, and that'll help you remember a little bit better. Okay, let me see. Um, oh, yeah, one more picture. Whee. So this just kind of shows childbirth. It's a cycle. There's no end until the baby comes out. So the head of the baby pushes down on the cervix, which is this part right here. That sends some information to the brain. The brain tells the pituitary gland to release more chemical called oxytocin. Oxytocin gets carried down to the uterus. The uterus then starts to contract and push the baby towards the cervix again, which pushes the baby's head against the cervix more, which goes there. to. So do you see how it just keeps it going more and more and more? The more the baby pushes against the cervix, the more chemicals produce. The more chemical, the more contractions. The more contractions, the more the baby pushes again. So it's really crazy. But the only thing that'll turn this off is the baby coming out. Actually, I lied. After the baby comes out, the placenta comes out, and you end up having contractions for about two or three days afterwards. Oh, that's not fun. But they're not nearly as bad as the ones as trying to actually push the baby out. Okay, I hope I scared some of you to not want to have uh, babies anytime soon. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so um, think about negative feedback examples besides body temperature, and we'll see if we can talk about those tomorrow. And then I'm going to ask you what the two positive feedbacks are. Um, so just memorize those, childbirth and blood clotting. All right, I think that's it. So uh, see you tomorrow. Bye.